Welcome back to the show. I am Kachi Opie. You're still watching Arise 360. Well, like I said, it is from social media to the performing arts now because I'm about to take you through the highlights of this week in art and culture. Now, Broadway star Carol Channing died this past week at the age of 97 of natural causes. The actress and singer was best known for starring in the musicals Gentlemen, Prefer Blondes, and Hello, Dolly. Channing also had significant Hollywood success, earning a supporting actress Golden Globe for the 1967 film Thoroughly Modern Millie. Her publicist said it was with extreme heartache that he announced the passing of an original industry pioneer, legend, and icon. And now, one of Tchaikovsky's most ambitious operas had its premiere in London to rave reviews this week. Now, it was directed by Stefan Herhein for the Royal Opera House. The Queen of Spades is basically a dark tale of greed and obsession. It's filled with passion and drama and is gripping enough for the critics and, of course, the audience who gave the opera rave reviews. <laughs> And now let's talk about an art exhibition in Israel featuring a crucified Ronald McDonald, which has sparked major protests by the country's Arab Christian minority. So hundreds of Christians calling for the removal of the sculpture entitled McJesus demonstrated at the museum in the northern city of Haifa are really upset about it. Now the museum's director said he was shocked at the sudden opera, especially because the exhibition had been on display for months. It has also been the, sh or rather, it has also been shown in other countries without any issues. It has refused to remove the artwork, saying doing so would just infringe on freedom of expression. And before the digital age of smartphones and amazing selfies, there was nothing more immediate than a Polaroid. And yes, there was no other artist who best embodied that era of instant gratification of digital photography than Andy Warhol. So the artist documented every moment of his time in New York during the 1970s and 1980s, basically immortalizing the friends and celebrities who circled him. Now, carrying his camera everywhere, he snapped portraits both as a way to collect his memories and prepare for his silk screens. And these portraits are now heading to London. This will be in an exhibit titled Andy Warhol Polaroid Pictures. The portraits, including pictures of Lizzie Minnelli and Jean Michel Basquiat, will now be in view from February 2nd to April 13th. And a decision by Taiwan's National Palace Museum to lend a very rare 1,000-year-old calligraphy to Japan has also sparked outrage across China. Now, the calligraphy titled Recome to My Nephew was painted by Yan Zhenqin, who is considered to be one of the greatest calligraphers in China. The artwork was preserved in China for centuries until it was taken to Taiwan in the 1940s. Since then, it's been kept securely by the Taiwan's National Palace Museum. And this is only the second time the work has been loaned overseas. Now, news of the loan shocked many users on China's, uh, rather China's social media site Weibo, many of whom reacted with anger. It has now been displayed in Tokyo as part of an exhibition titled on rival calligraphy, Yan Zheng King and his legacy. So while the world, every single person literally, awaits Steven Spielberg's adaptation and reimagining of the classic musical West Side Story, while well, you see Sydney Opera House is not even waiting, they're putting on their own production. So an all singing, all dancing supporting cast will take on the show's legendary score, original choreography, and Stephen Sondheim's memorable lyrics at Sydney Harbour. Now, if you don't already know, let me tell you a bit about West Side Story. So it's a modern day take on the classic tale of Romeo and Juliet. The 1961 film won 10 Academy Awards, becoming the record holder for the most wins for a movie musical. And of course, the sequel to Nigerian-American author Tomi Adeyemi's 
best-selling young adult novel, Children of Bone and Blood, or rather Blood and Bone, is on its way and we cannot wait for it. So Children of Blood and Bone spent 44 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and it follows the adventures of a 17-year-old girl on a mission to restore magic to the nation of Orisha. The new book called Children of Virtue and Vengeance will hit shelves on June 4th prior to the release of her debut novel. Adeyemi landed a six-figure movie deal from Fox Studios to turn her book into a feature film. Now, that will be one feature film to watch. Well, it is time for another break. Stay tuned to our Rice 360. When we return, it will be all about today's film and TV news, and there's so much goodness for you there. Stick around. Welcome back to Arise 360. I am Kachi Ophir. Well, you see, the movie business has been busy, and so have we, because we know what they've been up to. So here comes today's news on film and television. So, last week, the critically acclaimed HBO series True Detective returned to our screens with a bang. Oscar-winning actor Mahashala Ali is the lead actor for the show's third season, and his performance is already getting so much praise. Well, here's the cast and crew on the behind-the-scenes action of True Detective. Two children are missing from a West Finger neighborhood. Police are asking all residents to keep an eye out and report anything unusual they might have noticed relevant to the case. We're dealing with an abduction, two kids gone missing. And this starts a journey that spans, I guess, like 40 years. When I started thinking of a way to tell a man's life story through the vehicle of a mystery, I almost immediately began to think about, well, where would this be? And then the story and the setting start to inform each other. There are places that we have to go that are deeply uncomfortable, unsettling. Walking up through these caves and being on the mountains and the cliffs, I think it made it distinctive to where we were and what our characters were experiencing. It spotlights up and down each one of these streets. Here, here, and here. In the wintertime, when we first get to Wayne and Roland and doing the investigation of the kids, we pretty much hazed in this entire neighborhood at night. There are cops looking with searchlights, and it just kind of gives this really eerie sense that I think signifies cause and the concern of the story. Houses are boarded up, people move away, industry leaves. This crime happens, and it shatters the community. Do you remember the place? I don't remember. The evolution of Wayne Hayes' journey. And obviously, this crime affects this character in a very significant way. Wayne is just a phenomenal character, filled with a sense of purpose. Going on the journey of the investigation, digging into the next clue, following the next lead, and finding suspects and questioning people. I went by your place, you sort of collect things, huh? I salvage trash that I can sell. You like kids, generally. Roland's pretty much the heavy, you know, when it comes time to do questioning, to do interrogations. This season, to me, has so much to do with life, memories, and just time. For Amelia, I think the case becomes a sort of surrogate child to take care of. As the teacher of the children, there's a really deep vested interest for that reason from the very beginning. As we all get deeper into the mystery, it becomes clear that this is going to be a story that will essentially take up a good chunk of all of our lives. It's a 30-year journey. It's a 30-year case. It goes a lot deeper than your typical mystery crime. You get an overview of Wayne Hayes' life and a sense of the bigger picture of the life of these people and the life of this community that's affected by this tragedy. It's that unfinished story of the missing child or those great fears is that your children disappear. 
Well, so far we've only got two episodes, but not to worry. Episode three is on, out on the 20th of January and episode four is out on the 27th of January 2019. Well, the Fire Festival was the most talked about festival experience of 2017, but you see, it was for all the wrong reasons. I mean, it was advertised by famous faces, including Kendall Jenner, Bella Hadid, and Hailey Baldwin. It was basically advertised as a glamorous party on a deserted island. Instead, attendees turned up to mattresses on rain-soaked floors, meals of cheese slices and bread, and their luggage thrown into, uh, into an unlit car park. Now, two streaming platforms, Hulu and Netflix, are taking on the story of the biggest fraud in music, but fans are not sure which one to watch. So, you see, the thing is, if you decide to watch Hulu's documentary, here's what you can expect literally trapped on an island. It was a shit show. Just chaos and anarchy. About to go to Fire Festival. Could be amazing. Could be a disaster. Fire Festival was supposed to be uh, the new Coachella, the new Burning Man. Exclusivity with access to premier talent. It was going to be an experience bordering on impossible. What's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Nightmare in paradise. There was no music. They were put into disaster relief tents. People started to have breakdowns. People started to have panic attacks. No idea what they were doing. It was also a health concern that there were people literally trapped on an island. It was a shit show. Just chaos and anarchy. It's a great time to be a con man in America. Whatever it takes, we are all in, and let's go and make this happen. William McFarlane created Fire Festival with rapper Ja Rule. You're sitting there saying, like, I have no idea what this guy does, but I'm pretty certain that it's not legitimate. Billy understood what millennials as a generation want. What Fire Festival did prove is that power of influence is real. These guys figured out a way to optimize social media, almost weaponize it. And that's really when it turned to something that became like a significant financial crime. There are people who help Billy commit fraud so that they can make their money. Somebody would post a question, the question would immediately get deleted. People would message me things like, I sold like everything I own just to go to this fantasy island festival. There were never thousands of acts booked and there were never millions of dollars paid. He's engaging in criminal acts and wire fraud. Billy, should we have any concern about the FBI? Uh, I'm not sure. Someone has got to stand up and say, this isn't real. Some people have called you a sociopath. How do you respond to that? You see, the romance between Netflix and Hulu, rather, is not surprising. I mean, once upon a time, Netflix was advertising uh, Killing Bird on Killing Eve, rather, on Hulu, saying people should go watch it over there. So I'm not surprised. Well, the second season of Netflix and Marvel show this time, The Punisher, is coming up, and there's been a lot of questions about its future. So, would it be cancelled like Daredevil, Iron Fist, and Luke Cage? Can it live up to the high standards set by the first season? Well, you see, if you're like us, you're asking yourself the same questions as well. Not to worry, here's what you can look forward to from The Punisher season two. Why did you help me in the bar that night? What was I supposed to do? I had to get involved. It is what it is, I guess. You know, it's almost like you were happy for the excuse. Who are those people? I don't know. I think you're hiding something. Everybody that I've ever cared about. How do you think that feels? Trust me, I know. A friend of mine betrayed me. I dreamed about the Punisher every night. He thinks that he has the right to judge me. I want him. We have a mutual acquaintance. 
I'm gonna cast on the girl. Billy Russo's back. And he has an army. Frank, people are gonna die. I'm gonna end it. What if Billy comes here? I'm not the one who dies, kid. I'm the one who does the killing. Some serious issues. Let me be what I'm meant to be. Give me some to eat. I'll need some money. Not suspicious at all.